everybody. I'm Diane Steepro, and tonight's program is going to be presented by Cassie Hoswald, who is Director of Freshwater Initiatives at the Sam Shine Foundation. This program is sponsored with funding from the Indiana uh, Humanities Unearthed Initiative, and we would like to thank Indiana Humanities for that help. And I'd like to now turn the program over to Cassie. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for having me tonight. And thank you all for coming out on a rainy, uh, inclement evening. I appreciate you being here. Um, we will go ahead and dive right in, no pun intended, on uh, freshwater mussels. That, and I call this presentation a shell of Indiana's rivers um, because they are shells in our rivers, but they also encapsulate some of the history of how we've used our land and our rivers in Indiana. So I am a uh, director of freshwater programs at the Sam Shine Foundation. And I joined them in November of last year. And uh, we're based here in New Albany. And um, I'll just give a little background on myself. These are my uh, retrievers. They're flat-coated retrievers. They love water. Um, and so I, I sort of use them as a barometer as I'm traveling around the state um, as to whether I'll let them swim in, in a said body of water uh, that tells me that that's kind of um, my um, litmus test for how clean something is. But freshwater mussels really are the litmus test. These guys can really swim anywhere. They'll just might get a little bit sick. And uh, I, I previously worked for the Nature Conservancy as a freshwater ecologist. Um, I worked across the state, but primarily in the Wabash River Basin. And uh, this is this is me uh, with some students on the Wabash um, near Lafayette, Indiana. My family's from Corydon, um, and right now I'm living in Bloomington, Indiana. So um, I do get to uh, visit around the state a bit and learn about our water resources and and um, land use uh, as it relates to that. So the outline for this evening um, is I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what freshwater mussels are. So it's freshwater mussels 101. Um, we'll talk about some of Indiana's rivers, and I have a map with me this evening that you can, you're free to look at um, after the presentation if you have questions about specific rivers and watersheds in Indiana. Then we'll talk about human muscle interactions, uh, the really interesting kind of uh, fun part. And finally, uh, some efforts to keep Indiana's rivers healthy and what we can all do to um, play a part in that. So to get started this evening, Colleen, I'll ask you to pass around a, a two of the two bigger shells maybe at this point in the presentation. I've got some examples of um, freshwater mussels from rivers, from the Blue River actually nearby. Um, but these names uh, sort of speak to um, the variety of freshwater mussels in Indiana. Indiana is uh, home to what was uh, initially home to 77 species of freshwater mussel. And this picture just kind of starts to give you an idea of what we mean by different species. They can take on very different forms, different sizes, um, and different characteristics. And so these names are really fun, I think. And this sort of speaks to the fact that um, our, you know, early settlers and and Native American people um, encounter these with frequency, enough frequency to actually give them names. So in particular, Pink Hill Splitter. Um, you can kind of guess that people walking in a stream um, would maybe encounter that and cut their heel. And so the, these names um, had significance. And um, I just was reading an account of one of the early um, people who made, a, who made a living off of freshwater mussels actually dying from an infection from stepping on a mussel shell. And it's, it's suspected that it probably was a pink, pink heel splitter that that, that uh, happened to that man. But these give you an ex an idea of the the heft and the the um just how much is there. And those are dead. Those don't have the living muscle in them any longer. So they're even more heavy whenever the the muscle is is in the shell. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what what that is that you're looking at. So um the the picture, uh, I'm sorry, you're not seeing the picture. Let me see if I can advance this. In the state of Indiana, yes, yes. Um, and freshwater mussels sort of um, get their, uh, they, they reach the zenith of their diversity in North America. So when you think about Africa, you think about big cats or Australia, you think about marsupials. In North America, and in particular, the Eastern United States, we have more mussel diversity than anywhere else in the world. And that just speaks to how much freshwater we have. We have a lot of different water bodies. And um, so lots of, lots of species and lots of, um, 
uh, of ways to interact with those. So, so the picture here is showing you um, a, a, a freshwater mussel and those, those kind of um, lines that you're seeing there are sort of like growth rings in a tree. So they, they can be aged externally with a, a living animal that you find in a river kind of that's a get that's a um, an estimate some some of sometimes in some years just like trees will not grow some years because there's a lot of um, there isn't much water freshwater mussels for one reason or another may not grow well in a given year so those those rings can be really close together but by and large you can count a mussel by its um, the, the rings and it lays it lays those down in concentric circles. And so the, the largest muscle in a freshwater muscle is its foot. Um, and this picture shows that foot. And so the foot can be just as long as the shell is, and that's what holds it in the riverbed. Um, and so that's what keeps it in place. So they're, they're completely sedentary animals. Um, they, they, they spend their whole life in essentially the same square meter about in a river or stream. And, uh, so they, they, um, are, are kind of living rocks in our river and they occur in our rivers uh, just like this. So um, if, yeah, you can advance that. Um, so the, this is the foot of different species. And, and when you're looking for mussels, you start to be able to know what species you're pulling out or at least a, a, a general idea based on how well grounded they are. So some species just bury in further. Um, sometimes they go completely below the, the bottom of the stream. And so you have to dig for them and um, I don't advise that, uh, but you can do that as a way for, of looking for them. The picture that you see here is a mussel. And again, this one is in Blue River. It's called a wavy rayed lamp mussel. And the the um, kind of spotted thing that you see the yellow, it's real, I don't have a pointer here um, to, to point this out, but you see the yellow shell. And above that is um, part of the, the mussel's um, lure and we'll talk about that in a moment but anyway that's just to show that animal how it's buried in the stream uh, sediment and so uh, this is kind of a clear sediment but when you start looking for these it's like uh, mushroom hunting in the spring is what I compare it to where you have to get your eye trained uh, it takes a little bit and what you're really looking for is the siphon of the muscle the little slit in the shell where it's it's breathing and so um, uh, this well let me just can you play the, um, go to the next uh, slide, Diane? And then if you can play that video, this just kind of gives you an idea of the, um, we'll talk about the muscle as we go, if it will play, I'm not sure it will. Oh, but it's not gonna play. Yeah, it is playing here. Um, so this is a pink heel splitter, the one we saw earlier. And this is, uh, this animal is, is what we call thinly compressed. It's, 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 um, it's not very inflated. Um, and so that kind of speaks to the, a small, it lives in a smaller river. It doesn't have to be as big to, um, it can, it can hold on in a, in that stream. And you see those, those, um, uh, growth rings that I'm talking about in this animal. And you, what, what I really want to point out in this picture is at the top, you see just a little bit of moss growing on the tip of that shell. That's the only part of that muscle that was actually above the bottom of the stream. Everything else was buried. And so that's what you're looking for when you're looking, you know, for, for these animals. And so the shell can be really beautiful because it's below the surface. It's completely clean and only algae grows where it's growing above the, the surface. And I said, those are that it's breathing is what it's doing when it's up above there. So a, a one freshwater mussel, these, these that I've passed around can filter 15 gallons of water a day, one mussel. And we have thousands of these in our rivers and streams, hundreds of millions, really. Um, and so 15 gallons of water is a keg of beer. That sometimes reaches people like, wow, that's a lot of water in one day, one mussel. And so these animals are cleaning our rivers and they're cleaning our rivers, but they also are taking in all the bad stuff that we're putting in our rivers potentially. And they're exposed to all those things and they live a really long time. So um, the one, the biggest muscle that we passed around is called an elephant ear. And I did a, a little um, age study of those in the Blue River. The Blue River is just west of here um, and it drains into it's a direct tributary to the Ohio River. There's lots of elephant ear mussels in the Ohio River. Um, the youngest animal was 45 years old and the oldest was 72. Um, so at that time I was in my early thirties. Um, and I'm like, I, I can't even imagine something, you know, that's 
twice my age living in this river. In the Ohio River, we have animals that have lived over a hundred years. So they are long lived animals and they're exposed to everything that we're throwing at them. They're, they're fairly resilient, actually. We just have really um, done a number to them and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But um, I, I like to, uh, if we can advance, I like to describe mussels as sort of the freshwater um, clean, the, the, the freshwater cleaning crew um, in our stream. So this kind of gets at that, uh, that, that's what they're doing for us. They're providing a real service. So the most interesting thing about freshwater mussels, in my opinion, is that they are parasites in their larval form. So I said earlier, they're sedentary in the river. They don't move around much. Um, the way they move around in streams and between streams is on fish hosts. And so uh, each mussel species has its own fish or group of fish that it will use as its fish host. And so you have male and female mussels um, and the, the um, male puts his sperm into the water column, the female takes them in, she broods eggs and then different at different times a year, different mussel species will release their eggs. And they do a number of different strategies to attract the fish so they can have a lure like I showed you on the the uh, muscle earlier, they can broadcast their larvae, which just look like little bits of, you know, whatever a fish might want to eat in the water column. Um, there's some muscles that even will grab fish and pull them in and, and put the larvae onto the, the fish gills. And so, um, so that's how they've solved this problem of movement and how to mix up the gene pool. Uh, so if you think about that, Mussels are really dependent on fish, which then adds another complexity to their life. They're drinking lots of water. They need a fish. Some of them only can use one species of fish. Some use multiple. So this elephant ear, um, it uses a fish called the skipjack herring. And the skipjack herring is a migratory fish. So it only moves upstream in the rivers this April, April kind of May time, time frame. It's a spring migrant. And so it had that muscle has to encounter that fish at just the right time for that life cycle to, to um, continue. So I have a little video that if you can play for me, Diane, this will demonstrate this, uh, this sort of unique thing that's going on under the surface of our rivers and streams right now. Um, and I, will it play for you? Yeah. So this is in a lab setting. This is captured in a lab. This is called a snuff box. Uh, it's a very small mussel and it uses a fish called a log perch. A log perch like to um, swim along the bottom and they kind of roll stones. And so that, that fish just got caught by that mussel. So sh she has a hold of that, of that fish. And that, you can see that now. Uh, this fish is about five inches long. And what's going to happen is that fish is going to sit there. She's going to put those larvae onto its gills and then she's going to relax and he's going to swim away. Um, it will not kill the fish. If you remember from biology 101, if you're a parasite, you don't want to kill your host. You just want to use them. You're a user. And uh, that fish will then um, have those larvae on its gills for two to three weeks. It will drop them off wherever they decide wherever, you know, conditions are right. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll drop off where conditions are right. These mussels are producing hundreds of thousands of larvae in hopes that just a few will survive. And many of them won't survive. They'll be eaten by th different things. They'll land in, in places that are inhospitable to mussels, but a few of them hopefully will live. So it's a precarious life. Um, therefore, they make um, a lot of, of young to sort of overcome that. But that, uh, to me, is the most fascinating thing about these animals is that they they don't have eyes, um, but they have senses and they know that something's, you know, that there are things that are really dynamic going on right, right under our, our noses. So now let's see if I can move forward here. Um, let's get into a few of our river habitats and, and what um, rivers we are um you know, how rivers are sort of divided around the state of Indiana. So um, I'll first talk about, well, let me, let's, uh, can we move forward one more, Diane? Thank you. Um, so this is not all of the, the rivers in Indiana. These are just some of the main ones that are uh, labeled here. Um, and, but rivers change from north to south. So northern Indiana rivers are much um, sandier in general, much sandier, 
uh, what what I describe as flatter rivers. So they don't have a high gradient. So they are slower and they um, they tend to have more wetlands associated with them. As you move south, you get steeper streams. So all the streams in Southeast Indiana are um, tributaries to the Ohio River and they start kind of high in the hills and they, they fall down to the Ohio River. And so they tend to be steep and they tend to be, um, they don't have as much muscle diversity because of that steepness. They never did. It isn't as if the muscles are gone that would have always been there that just would never have been as many in those places as there are in these um, slower, um, wider rivers and mussels. You saw the picture of them in the substrate. That's probably the key to their um, success is, is having um, a, a good stable substrate and not having um, real uh, lots of uh, flooding events that are unnatural uh, is, is not good for their their um, life history. So we'll move forward one, Diane, to um, I think we'll start with the Tippecanoe River. And the Tippecanoe is a tributary to the Wabash. Um, it That's the watershed of the Tippecanoe River. So everything in that blue blob is draining to the Tippecanoe River. The Tippecanoe River is the most uh, muscle diverse river in the state of Indiana. And that is uh, a bit puzzling uh, to many people because Kentucky has more mussels than, than Indiana because Kentucky has di more diversity of stream types. And um, they have some mountainous streams and that those have their own mussel species. So it's sort of interesting that you, you jump from Kentucky all the way up to the Tippecanoe River and then you, you get this amazing diversity again. And let's move forward one. Um, image. And uh, this is just a picture taken along the Tippecanoe River. And so I think one of the um, many reasons that it's, first of all, it's a Wabash River, a big Wabash River tributary. And so the bigger the stream, the more mussel species it has. It's just the, the, the way it is. So it will have big river mussels and it will have, you know, these little, these uh, species that occur more in creeks. Um, whereas a small creek won't have those big river mussels. It'll just have the things that should occur in a creek. So the Tippecanoe River um, is a very sandy river and mussels kind of like that if it's not real shifty sand, but it's a groundwater fed system. So it isn't as much runoff as it is water coming up from the bottom of the stream. And that keeps the stream substrate clean. Um, so that really is good for mussels. Um, and the other thing that I notice when I'm in the Tippecanoe River watershed is you see the trees on the far bank and you can kind of see through those trees. You can tell there's a, a field or a, you know, a um, how, that's probably a field on the other side of that. But we have this area that that's called the riparian buffer and riparian just refers to stream along a river. And uh, there's a buffer between the field and the river. There's trees and that it's not very wide and it doesn't have to be wide. The wider, the better for river health, but it, it almost a lot of the Tippecanoe River has this riparian buffer. And that to me is one of the um, hallmarks of a good river system is, is a buffer between whatever land use and the river. Um, and, and people tend to like to cut down the trees either to grow more crops or to have a view of the, of the river. Um, and that's really one of the worst things you can do for a water body is to cut down that barrier of trees because it not only does it filter whatever's coming off the land, but it also shades the stream and it keeps that water cooler. And therefore uh, um, it, that, that cool water um, in, enhances fish habitat. And therefore when you have more fish, you have more mussels. Okay, let's move forward one. Um, so uh, just a, this is just an example of some, uh, this, this mussel in my, that's my hand, um, that's called a raid bean. Um, and that's as big as it gets. So while these mussels are really, these shells that I have here are really big, that's a really small mussel. And uh, it's a, it's host, fish host is a darter. And the darter um, you can see in this image here, it's a, that's a blue breast darter. And darters are little bitty fish. They live in um, the white, kind of the whitewater parts of rivers. So they, they like really clean, um, what we call river substrate. And then this is just another muscle, you know, you can kind of see this, the, the picture, the significance of this picture is how sandy that river is. And so, um, so this, the raid bean is a federally endangered species. It's not very common anymore. Um, and it tends to be those little species that depend on those little fish um, that are disappearing across uh, North America. And that's uh, a number of reasons probably why, but those little fish are really sensitive to oxygen levels. They're really sensitive to siltation. And um, those, if those fish are gone, then those mussels are gone. 
So then we'll move on to the Kankakee River. And um, I will refer you to the book, uh, Rivers of Indiana by Richard Simons. It's a really, it was written in the 80s or 90s. And it's just a really nice compendium of um, all of our major rivers across Indiana. And I love this quote that he has in there about the Kankakee River. So you'll notice that's even further in, in further north in Indiana. And that's the prairie region. So that's um, also very sandy. And it really was a big wetland, the Kankakee River was. And um, let's move forward one uh, slide, Diane. Um, Indiana uh, has tried to control that river. And so they've straightened it. And this picture is just an image of, of the Kankakee River. And, and what strikes me here is those are kayaks or canoes in the you know background of that photo. So there's a, a long stretch of river where I can see all the way down it. And that that's not winding and curvy like what Simon described in his book um, because we straightened it. And so by straightening it, we've made it really bad muscle habitat, made really bad habitat for other things. Um, Yes. Oh. Gonna have to keep my head where I was. <laughs> That's okay. Do you might have any questions while we're waiting? After they fall off the fish? They they fall off of the gills. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're they're just taking um blood from the fish while they're on the, the gills. And then yeah, so they're yeah, they're, they're just, they're just kind of live, they're just kind of hanging out there. They're, they insist on the gills and then they fall off whenever they're good and satisfied, I guess. And then they, then they become a free living adult. Not a, I guess you would consider it an adult. It's really a juvenile, but they're free living at that point. And they're not parasites in their adult form. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everybody likes to eat a muscle. Uh, yeah. So raccoons, minks, um, otters now. Um, yep. And that, that, um, uh, difference in how strong they bury really plays out in what species are targeted by those predators. Um, so yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the, the, uh, muscle that I chose to sort of exemplify the Kankakee river is the black sand shell. And this is a, these, these muscles can get huge, but you know, that one's not that big, but you know, they, they are very big muscles. They depend on walleye and sauger. Um, and that's a game fish. And so, uh, in the Kankakee river, the only place where these muscles are found is on the edge. They used to would have been found everywhere, but now they're only found on the edges of the river where, um, habitat is starting to kind of recover from that straightening that happened. Um, and, but they occur more in Illinois than Indiana because Illinois did not straighten their part of the river. So the river is much more scenic in Illinois and um, there's, there's efforts going on now in the Kankakee River watershed to start restoring some of that sinuosity, which is takes the power out of the water and is what mussels are looking for. Okay, let's advance to the Wabash River. Um, and again, great quote by Richard Simons on the Wabash and how, you know, we think of the Wabash as Hoosiers, but then how the outside world thinks about the Wabash. And I was at a conference in uh, California a few years ago, and um, the, the, uh, there was a famous um, geomorphologist out there. And I was asking him, you know, what do we do to restore the Wabash river? And he said, keep the Wabash wild. And it is a wild river. The, the significance of the Wabash 
um, is, is first of all, it drains two thirds of Indiana. And most of our population gets its uh, drinking water from the Wabash Basin, but it um, also flows from the confluence with the Ohio River um, from Huntington, Indiana to the confluence of the Ohio River with, with no dam. So there's a dam in Huntington and there isn't another dam until you get into the Ohio River. So that, so the Wabash is connected to the Ohio and there aren't dams in between. And that's the significance of the Wabash River that makes it restorable. And that's why we still have 148 of the 151 uh, historic species of fish in the Wabash. So there's only three species missing that historically had been there. Um, so that's that is really significant and um, that's what makes the Wabash so special. So let's uh, talk just a little bit about the Wabash if you want to advance one. So um, the uh, southern part of the Wabash, of course, is a big river. This is the floodplain. This is a big, um, what we call an oxbow lake. Those have formed in the lower Wabash. Um, and those are fascinating habitats. But there's really cool fish that hang out just in those places. And uh, so that, that's the southern part of the Wabash. But the upper part is, is more like a, a, a tip of canoe or an eel river. It's just a little bit bigger. And that's where those streams are, drain, are draining into the, to the Wabash. But it's a very... Um, nice system. It has a lot of um, problems as well, but uh, the Wabash um, is something we should be proud of. So the I picked a couple species of fish to exemplify the Wabash. So on the left is a, a paddlefish, and that picture was taken on um, Halloween um, a, a few years ago. And the significance of that, why I remember that, is first of all, it was a very cold Halloween. Um, but November 1st is when uh, you can start harvesting paddlefish with a commercial license on the Ohio River. This was taken at Mackey Bend, the last bend of the Wabash before it enters the Ohio. And it's an oxbow lake now because it had there was some reshifting of the river a few years ago. And so there's this eight mile long oxbow lake. And this fish was in there. And this is a this was a female and they cannot be harvested in the Wabash River. So they're seeking shelter in these, you know, um, these special habitats. So that's a, a paddlefish, the which um, I don't know what species of mussel depends on paddlefish, if any, they, there probably are some, um, but that's a, a special, you know, fish from the Wabash. Um, Lake sturgeon is one of the most significant fish in the Wabash River Basin, and that really only occurs in the East Fork of the White River, so that's a tributary, but it occurs in the, the watershed. And notice that clean gravel substrate. They want that to spawn on and to feed on. And then the lower picture is a rainbow darter. And so those are the little bitty fish. So you get the little bitty to the great big in the Wabash. And so all of these things um, have something to say about the quality of the river and then um, what mussels can live there. So you get things like the namesake, the Wabash pig toe. Um, again, one of those clever, you know, names, but it's something that's named after the Wabash River. The first time scientists who were describing species encountered this species of mussel, they named the, it, it was found in the Wabash and they named it as such. So now we'll move on to the Blue River, which is where I have done, um, yeah, uh, can, oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, and so my last quote from Simons, and if, has anybody canoed or kayaked in the, the Blue River or swam in the Blue River? Yeah, most, most people have, have gotten to experience it. It's a wonderful place. And I worked in this watershed exclusively for 15 years. So um, it is um, very near and dear to my heart. And my family's farm is in the, the Blue River watershed. So I love this place. Uh, so the Blue River is a very different stream. And I mentioned earlier that Southeast Indiana isn't like most of the rest of, of Indiana. And so it's a very rocky stream and it's a karst system. It's, it's cave fed. Um, and so I, I mentioned that the Tippecanoe River was groundwater fed and the Blue River is fed by caves and springs. So it also has a lot of groundwater influence and that cold water holds more oxygen. And so when you have more oxygen, you have more fish. And when you have more fish, you have more mussels. And so the Blue River has, historically, it had about 43 species of mussels, and now it's got about 26. So it doesn't have its full diversity of mussels that it once did. But there are some things going on there, again, not related to the water quality of the Blue River, but related to fish that should be there that aren't. And the, the uh, picture on the bottom, I just want to point out, um, it's, it's a little bit hard to see maybe in this light, but there's, you know, some circles that you see in that pasture field. Those are all sinkholes. So 
a lot of the Blue River has no surface streams. The streams are all underground. And I like to describe Blue River really as a, a surface expression of a karst stream. Is, and that's really what it is because it kind of comes up and goes down um, pretty quickly because of that karst or, or cave nature. Um, these are some of the species that occur in the Blue River. So um, this is wavy rayed lamp mussel in, in someone's hand on the right. Um, that's a beautiful mussel. And it's rare in Indiana, but it occurs in Blue River. We actually did a um, project restoring, doing a restoration of this species in the Blue River. Um, and that's a smallmouth bass that someone has caught, and that's the fish host for it. So anytime you have um, a game fish that people like to, you know, fish for, um, and you can connect it to a freshwater mussel, you start getting people's attention. Oh, well, if we have more of these fish that I like to catch, then we're going to have more of this mussel. And um, so people that can kind of uh, spark some interest and get them interested in things. Um, and then this is just a, a, a nice image of the Blue River on the bottom. Um, I'm, I already mentioned the uh, skipjack herring being a host for the elephant ear mussel. This picture is the lower Blue River. And in the background, you can just barely see the Ohio River. So this is, this is flowing through Harrison Crawford State Forest. And I mentioned that um, Blue River's good water quality. We know we have hellbenders. It's the only river in Indiana that still has a hellbender salamander. Look that up if you haven't heard of that. Um, but uh, if if the Blue River can't, can't um, produce young elephant ear because we don't find young elephant ear. We find old ones, lots of these big old ones. But we don't find young ones. And the reason we don't find young ones is the fish host, the skipjack herring, doesn't occur in the Blue River like it once did. And you're, you think, well, why not? The Blue River is good. But we have locks and dams on the Ohio River to, to um, facilitate navigation and skipjack herring don't move through the locks and dams in the numbers that they once did. And so we remember earlier, I said the strategy is you flood your fish host with lots of, of young in hopes that a few will successfully transform. And if you don't have lots of fish to encounter, then your strategy isn't real good. And so um, we, we have a, a geriatric population of elephant ear mussel in the Blue River as a result. And so there are efforts uh, working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to um, reoperate their dams to facilitate fish passage um, along with, you know, commercial barge traffic. And, and there are ways to do that. So um, there is hope there. Uh, this map just shows you the total number of freshwater mussels, you know, across um, the U.S., and so you see Indiana 77, Kentucky's 103, and really Alabama takes the cake in terms of muscle diversity. But again, think about the variety of habitats they would have, and it really is related to that. But the lower map shows the percentage of imperiled. And so 50% of our muscle species in Indiana are imperiled. And that's uh, you know definitely cause for concern. And so there are bright spots, but um, there, there are reasons behind this. And let's um, get into that now. I will um, skip this video in, in favor of time, Diane. Let's let's move on from that. Um, so we'll go to um, human freshwater muscle interactions. If you just want to, yeah. And uh, so the and if you want to move forward, one more. Um, the the first um, encounter of uh, freshwater mussels with um, with people in Indiana was Native Americans. And so they used these mussels um, mostly for uh, decorations. Um, and these, you know, have been found in shell mounds and, and um, you know, for cere ceremonial reasons. Um, they would have eaten freshwater mussels, but that would not have been a preferred food or, you know, it would have been a subsistence type eating. It wouldn't have been that there would have been clam bakes or mussel bakes because these animals live a long time, right? And so they're, um, they're kind of muscly and, and gritty and um, they're, they're, you know, filtering lots of water. And so they, they wouldn't have ever been like a preferred food source. And so people always want to know, can you eat them? And now it's illegal to possess mussels in Indiana. So you can't eat them, um, but you also wouldn't want to eat them again because of how much exposure they have to the, the things that are in our environment. Um, and then in the early 1900s, 
there was a, um, a freshwater pearl rush. And uh, so this is, you know, an example um, from the Kankakee River of um, in 1905. And then in, in uh, 1903, there was, uh, there's an account, this is really hard to read, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it, you know, for you. Um, for several weeks, the people of Maunee, um, a small town in Illinois, a small town in the Wabash River, have become greatly excited over the finding of many valuable pearls ranging in price from $20, from $10 to $250. The river's a veritable beehive and scores are at work scouring mussel shells. The price of shells has risen from $4 to $15 a ton, and an experienced man can secure a ton in a day. Farmers find it difficult to get farm hands, and that was from the Jasper paper in 1903. So I did a little calculation. So $15 in 1903 today would be like $560. So that was significant. But think about that, a ton of mussel shells just to see if there's a pearl in it, but you can't find the pearl unless you kill the animal. And so that's sort of strike one against mussels is this freshwater pearl um, boom. And then we move into what uh, many more people know about, which is the pearl button industry. And so um, again, Indiana was a huge, um, that was a huge industry in Indiana from the early 1900s until about 1940 when plastics came into vogue and the pearl button industry collapsed. This picture is taken on the White River and um, this man, or this is Wabash, I'm sorry. Uh, this man is standing in, in front of um, what are called, they're called a crowfoot bars. So these bars were drug along the bottoms of the rivers and mussels clamped onto those hooks and then were brought up. And so you can see on all, almost all of his hooks, he has a mussel. And so again, think about that. There's no, way, there's no river in Indiana that I can think of where you could drag that and catch that many mussels today. Um, so that was definitely, um, uh, talk about depleting stocks. At the same time, what's happening in Indiana, we're deforesting. I mean, almost all of our state was deforested at that time. So you've got all this, you know, water, all this mud running into our rivers, and then you're, 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 you know, killing these animals. This is what, how the pearl buttons were created though. They, they were very efficient at using the shells. And I've got an example of a shell there. If you want to pass that around, Colleen, that's got the, um, the freshwater um, pearl button blanks um, carved out of it. And so there were certain species that were more preferable. They had a nicer nacre on the inside. That pink heel splitter probably was favored because that's really had a really pretty pink or purple um, interior shell. And so they were pro they were sent out to um, Iowa, but their big factories were out there on the Mississippi River for um, for processing the mussels. Um, so this picture, let's move forward. Yeah, this picture. I'm sorry, I've got two presentations going on in here. Um, the, you can see the men and you see the mounds of shells that they're they're sitting on. Um, this also is taken in Indiana. And this reminds me of those pictures of men sitting on uh, buffalo, the buffalo, you know, skulls. Uh, think how full our rivers were of, of freshwater mussels uh, at the, the turn of the century. Um, and this picture is taken from Leavenworth. I just think that's interesting. It's harder to tell, but there's a big mound of shells in the, in the foreground of that picture as well. And so, um, so this was happening on the Ohio River as well. And then there was an area in Vincennes, Indiana, again, on the Wabash River called Pearl City. It was like a shanty town that, that grew up around this. You're shaking your head. Yes. So you're familiar with this. Um, and so, uh, so that, you know, speaks to how, um, how much of an industry this was in Indiana. And finally, um, we, we train our, 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 um, our muscle use transferred to the cultured pearl industry. And so um, Japan really um, perfected a technique where they were, were cult culturing freshwater pearls in their, um, in their uh, shells over there, but they needed uh, shells from the Mississippi River with its high calcium levels to make that process happen. And so people would, were until the 90s in Indiana, were were harvesting mussel shells and sending to um, Japan for the cultured pearl industry. And Indiana closed that down in, the, in 1991 because, because our numbers were dwindling so much. The only rivers in Indiana, I'm sorry, the only rivers in the U.S. where that still happens are the Tennessee River and um, maybe the Cumberland. I know the Tennessee River. So Tennessee is the only state that still allows um, mussel harvest. So this um, headline was taken in 2020, I took this picture in 2021, um, eight 
uh, you know, of the 20 extinctions that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was proposing, eight of those were freshwater mussels. So it's not federally endangered, that's extinct. And um, that is a tragedy. And it's something we, we should be concerned about this because it says something about our environment that this is happening. And so we, we you know, need a kind of an all hands on deck approach and just awareness that these animals are out there. And there's this incredible diversity that we're, we're losing. So let's think a little bit about current practices that are now leading to mussel demise. We're not harvesting them at this point. We're not eating them. Um, although I do have people from time to time bring me shells and ask me what they can do with it. And I'm like, oh, the animal's dead. You, you can't have that. Um, but anyway, think about our land use. So we, you know, historically we're, we were about 80% forested across the state of Indiana. Um, and now we're about 20%. Um, and, and water falling, imagine water falling on the green forest versus, you know, what you see on the right. Um, and, and we have to think about how do we handle our water that's falling on our roofs and falling on our roads and falling on lawns that have no natural vegetation to slow water down. We have to think about how to capture and hold on to our water before we just let it run away. Um, we also are really good in Indiana at drainage. You know, we're, we're a heavily agricultural state. And so we have lots of drains, artificial drains even. And um, it, 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 it's sort of concerning to see um, the, the, the silt coming in, the, the sediment coming in off of this um, field. And we have ditches that look like this. And so it leads to banks de destabilization again, just a lot of water rushing through our system. This, um, this image shows um, the 11 greatest flood events in New Harmony. So New Harmony is at the end of the Wabash River, essentially. Um, and out of the 11, since 1900, the, the 11 greatest floods, six of those have happened in the last 30 years. So we are, we, we're getting more water, we have more rainfall, but we also are really getting good at getting the water off of the land and downstream to someone else. And that's not good for freshwater mussels. It looks like this, where you have a rain event in central Indiana that wipes out a, a, an ag field. And actually, that's the that rain event is what caused that new channel to cut in the Wabash River and, and form that Oxbow Lake. And so uh, there was so much sediment lost from Indiana in, in one flood event that it closed commercial barge traffic on the Ohio River. We, we plugged the, the Ohio with our sediment, which is money. Um, and there's animals in there. So, uh, you can't, the mussels don't live well in places that are, that are shifty or that fill up with sediment. This map just shows our contribution um, of nitrate nitrogen to the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the darker color is bad. It's, it's, it's just more, those, those gray circles are watersheds. And so the darker Brown means the, you know, more, um, uh, just a, a greater volume. And so you can see that northern and central Indiana are some of the contributors. It's the I states, Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa, where we grow lots of corn, we have lots of drainage ditches, and we put lots of nitrogen on our fields to grow that corn instead of building up our soil health and, and letting the soil feed the crops. And so um, this is a concern for us, but it's also a concern for the Gulf where they um, have dead zones because of the um, nutrient pollution. And finally, um, we have low head dams in Indiana. So we have locks and dams on the Ohio River, but we also have these dams that um, we have on lots of our streams. This is on the Muscatatuck River. Um, and a dam, if you're a fish this size, you can't breach that. So if you are a mussel that needs that fish that size, you can't occur upstream of that. And anything that is occurring upstream of that is a relic of the past and won't persist for real long. So those are some of the the problems with our rivers. And let's end on a high note now about uh, keeping our rivers um, healthy. And so um, we can promote things like cover crops and, and there's a big effort in Indiana through many different conservation organizations to um, help uh, agriculture use cover crops, not only to hold the soil in place when it rains in the winter because cover crop covers the land when there's not a cash crop on it, but also it absorbs water better and it builds up soil. So our soil gets healthier and we're not losing as much soil. So, and there's multiple benefits. You see the worms, you see the pollinators. Um, and so this is kind of an old practice that's new again and it's gaining in, in popularity. Indiana is only second to Texas in cover crop adoption. So in Texas is a much bigger state, right? So um, we're kind of proud of that. Um, we also promote riparian buffers. And again, riparian just refers to right along the river. And these are uh, buffers of trees that just filter out 
stuff that's washing off the land and also shade the streams. And when we get a flood, then they can, those riparian buffers really hold a lot of the debris and a lot of the water. So they are a good strategy for cities and towns to think about riparian buffers upstream of them, um, but also just uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, we have floodplain protection. So uh, putting areas, uh, letting, letting the flood water get to places that are um, just set up to be conservation land and let them store that water and, and uh, let those nutrients settle out. Um, everything from ditches, you can do that in a ditch all the way to a river system like the Wabash. Um, and that's, that's uh, definitely something that Indiana um, is working on. Low head dam removal, um, that's another strategy. And, and um, I've been involved in a number of these across Indiana and there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a dam that's not used for anything else come out. And so the uh, picture on your right in particular is Big Indian Creek in Corydon. And uh, we removed two, of, we've removed three of the dams actually in that creek, there's only one more to go. Um, and that creek will be completely free flowing. And that's really significant for uh, mussels and fish and and people because people have died at these dams. And lastly, um, I'll mention reintroduction. Um, there are efforts in different places around Indiana to reintroduce mussels. And so this is a kidney shell mussel. You can see her little eggs. They look like mustard seeds in there. Um, and these are her babies. So we 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 take the the uh, mussels, uh, we take the the larvae out, infest fish in a lab um, in Frankfort, Kentucky and then bring them back to Indiana. And um, we put tags on them and we put them in these silos in different streams to see how which, which places will support them. And then where they, they, they grow and thrive in those silos, then we do actual reintroductions. And so um, that's really exciting. And it's exciting that there are places where this is, is happening. So um, with that, I'll just leave you with a couple action items. Um, think about your own place. Reduce water and pollution runoff from your home or farm or your, your apartment um, complex even. Um, retention ponds are, are a good thing. And, and, you know, think about how to get your water there versus uh, just, you know, down the storm drain. Tell someone what you learned today about freshwater mussels and the health of our rivers and just get people excited. They don't know. People do not know these things live here and how special um, they are. And then um, support conservation organizations. There are the Nature Conservancy is one. Um, the Department of Natural Resources has a non-game wildlife fund that is funding some of this reintroduction work. And so you can do checkoffs on your tax returns even for the, the DNR. And with that, I will ask for questions and um, invite you to come up. There's lots of different examples of mussel shells up here. And um, I appreciate your time this evening. Yes, thank you, Kara. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. So Kara's question was if, uh, if a fisherman, uh, finds a, or fisher person finds uh, a fish with that's infested with glachidia, do they need to put that fish back? And unfortunately it, it, you couldn't see that unless it was under a microscope. So you don't have any idea that that's going on. And so there aren't any laws about that. Um, there is, there are people doing studies, um, asking, you know, for particular species of fish, if you come across this, would you take the gills out and preserve them and send them? And, and you know, there's, that's very niche and, and not a lot of species, but actually for skipjack herring, we're considering that um, in the white river because that, that fish is used for um, bait and, Oh, are we are we catching fish just for bait to, that are infested with with babies potentially? So good idea. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, yes. You have to have a permit to possess uh, freshwater mussels. Ah. Good question. So the di the difference, uh, the question is, uh, what is the difference between a freshwater and a saltwater mussel? Um, and so the the differences that I know of, and I'm sure there are more, um, are that saltwater mussels tend to be um, much shorter lifespan, um, and um, they there there are some species that will sort of inhabit that in between yes the brackish water um but these definitely and they don't but yeah it's just the the lifespan is is the real difference 
as far as I know, yes, they're essentially. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 And, and oysters are, you know, it kind of, they're oysters are not mussels, but sort of that idea of uh, filtering water oysters are doing the same thing, providing that service. And, and, and there's a lot of oyster reef restoration right now on the coast. And I think there's a case to be made for our humble freshwater mussels are there. They are infrastructure in our, in our rivers, because there's providing uh, stability to our systems that, that those um, freshwater species, or I'm sorry, saltwater species are too. Yeah. You had another question, I think. Oh, uh, the question is, what is the pearl? And so um, I told you that I sent off a bunch of shells to be aged. I, I sent them to a lab that, uh, a f U.S. Forest Service lab that does, they, they, they've uh, got a technique where they shave the mussel shell in half and they actually count the rings properly. And I had a shell that actually had a, a pearl in it. And so it's just a little, it's a piece of debris that gets inside that shell. Easy to see how that would happen. And the, the, the nacre, the inside of the, the shell starts growing over that piece of debris. And so it, it's, it's just a piece of dirt and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, so it starts growing over it and creates that pearl, but that shell had, I had a a shell with a pearl in it. And I told myself when I um, finished my, I was working on my master's degree, I'll, I'll, I'm going to get that made into a necklace. And I sent that away inadvertently. I didn't mean to do it. And so it's lost, <laughs> but you know, I think on average, they say one in a hundred shells will have a pearl in it of, of some size. So, um, you can imagine if those were actually worth, you know, now they're not worth as much as they would have been in the early 1900s, but that would have been pretty attractive to, they, they can, yes, the cultured, the cultured pearls that they grow in Japan are exactly that. Yes, yes. Oh, great. That's a great question. Other pre other predators besides the meso predators. So there are certain fish species, native fish species that eat mussels. So freshwater drum in particular is a fish that eats mussels. So there's sort of a, a give and take there where I'm going to eat some, but it, freshwater drum are also the host for a number of, of mussels. And so uh, I guess they're kind of getting each other back there, but there is a, um, um, an invasive fish that's the, so you've heard of the Asian carp, but there's black carp that are moving up um, the Mississippi right now. And they are, they eat mussels. And so that is a big, another concern. Yeah. 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 Yep. Do invasive shellfish uh, pose any threat to our, our local freshwater buses? Okay, so the question is, do, do invasive shellfish pose a threat to our native mussels? And absolutely they do. So you've heard of zebra mussels um, and zebra mussels will encrust uh, our freshwater mussel shells so that whatever part of the shell is above the river um, substrate, if, if the river has um, zebra mussels in it, those, will, they, those can be completely coated and they cut off uh, um, filtration. And so they essentially, mussels can... They can live a while without eating, but not forever. Um, and so that's one example. The other thing zebra mussels do, um, and this is hard to imagine in Indiana because most of our rivers are loaded with nitrogen and, and um, phosphorus fertilizer. And so there's lots of food available. And so in, in the Great Lakes, for instance, where there isn't as much food, they can cause crash. They, they eat so much. They're so effective at filtering that they can cause a crash of useful food in the diet of native fish. That isn't the case in Indiana, um, but that's because our rivers are unnaturally nutritious. Yes. Yes. Yeah. An adult, an adult muscle 15 can filter 15 gallons of water a day. I, I did some calculations once of how many muscles it would take to actually clean a given river. And I can't remember. It was 
ungodly, then it, it would never happen. But um, it is an interesting thought about a natural solution. And so when we think about, um, in particular, surface water that has to be treated before we can drink it, um, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to do as much treatment because we had enough muscles? So they can save us money um, if we, you know, we, we, we like to engineer solutions and we've got some pretty good ones right there in our stream systems. Yes. Um, so, um, I didn't, I just highlighted some of our rivers, um, but Silver Creek doesn't get, doesn't dry up, um, in the summer. It's kind of actually kind of east of that car span, but in general, those Silver Creek's one of those tributaries to the Ohio that's, that's a little steeper than west and north of here. And so it just historically wouldn't have had as many species, um, but, but some of the species are still there that should be there and it's well connected to the Ohio River so that's good the Ohio River tends to be a source population for a lot of those creeks so always there's fish coming in that are bringing things from the Ohio in um, and so so yeah it's it's it would have mussels all you know not not a ton but it does have mussels yes It will help, which I don't know which dam you're talking about, but yes, any dam removal would be good for a mussel. Yeah. Yes, great question. So the, the question is, are they filter feeders? And they are. They eat um, algae and bacteria. They even eat E. coli. Um, so we have E. coli problems in our water. And so that that's, you know, another service that they provide. But there is some um, some studies going on right now uh, related to al to the species of algae that they're eating. Um, and so while there's lots of algae in a lot of our systems, um, some of that is not nutritious. So it's kind of like you or I eating, living on candy. I'd love to do it, but it isn't good for me. It might make me gain weight instead of lose weight, but um, you get the point. It, it's not necessarily healthy what they're filtering. And so uh, we, we may be changing the balance and there may, there's some, maybe some explanation for why certain streams muscles are thriving and others they aren't. And it may be related somewhat to the algae. It's, it's not one answer. Yeah. <laughs> solution yeah yeah I don't think they will again I don't think they would want to eat the blue green algae either um but they could be filtering things before it gets to that point because the the blue green algae is sort of the the problems with it are um it, it gets to that point and we could keep it from getting to that point potentially so good good idea and um Oh, there was another point I wanted to make on that. I, I don't remember what it is. Sorry. I think you had a question. I can't speak to, I, I would think, yes, I haven't, I don't know what, like how big are they? Little bitty. Yeah. Okay, so there is a um, a non-native species that's ubiquitous in Indiana uh, called Corbicula or Asian clam, and I would like that size and smaller. It's probably that they have real prominent ridges on them, um, and they are everywhere. And they're not something that we worry about a whole lot. They've been here since the '60s, like they've been here a long time. Um, but they don't get as big as what you're saying, two inches plus they wouldn't be. So, but there are species that occur in lakes, not rivers. And so very likely it's, that's what is, is it's something that should be there. Yep. And when you see the, when you see the mussel shell, of course, laying out of the water, it's dead, but even um, in a river or stream, if you see it, if you can see the shell, it's usually not alive or it's struggling somehow. They want to be buried and hidden from their predators. They, they don't open up. They, what happens is the, um, the adductor muscle that, that holds it shut relaxes, but it doesn't cause the shell necessarily to open up. But when you pick it up, either, either it's 
completely gone. You know, the insides are completely gone or it's, it's worse if it has just recently died because you pick it up and it's like, it, it's very gross, uh, gooey in there. So yeah, they don't, they don't tend to just open up unless they were, um, uh, if you had a really extreme drought, they're smart. They live in the deepest parts of, you know, rivers and streams, but, but there are some that always settle on those marginal areas at best. And if you get a, a year, you know, they're, uh, let's say it's 10 years since we've had our last big drought and you had a muscle that settled on a, near a sandbar or, you know, a gravel bar and the river recedes, they can, they can move a little bit and they can move down but only to a certain degree. So if you have a real fast dry down, they will, and they're in the sun, then they're gonna pop open a little more. Oh gosh, <laughs> I wish you hadn't asked me that question. The question is what is the difference in a muscle and a clam? And I, I just can't answer that. I have looked it up before, it, it comes up a lot and I, there is a difference. Yes. There is a different, um, species. Yes. Uh, well, we have, we don't have any native clams. Uh, we have the Asian clam. Um, and I think it has to do with how it siphons water, but don't quote me on that. Our clams. Um, I would think they would be very similar to a, a muscle. There's not a, there's not a way to effectively move. Yes. If someone moves a muscle, are don't move a muscle. <laughs> in, in real life, once I, I caught a bunch of kids pulling one out of the yeah, water and yeah, they yeah. put it back, yeah. will that survive after it's put back? Yes, they will. They are. Um, so the question is, will a muscle survive if you move it in a stream? And so when we are surveying for muscles, what we do is we, um, you know, pull them out, identify, measure all that. And we put them back in the really close to where they came from. Um, and, and, you know, kind of even put them back in like babysit them. But if you, if you saw that happen, the best thing to do, since you might not be sure where the top and bottom is, is just to lay it, you know, on a, not on a rock. Cause they can't bury into a rock, but put it, you know, back down in an area where it's going to be able to bury itself. And they can do that very quickly and they're tactile. So they'll figure that out. So yeah, try to go for the deeper water. Don't put it near the edge of the water. Any other questions? Oh, great question. Uh, so the question is, is there any uh, reforestation efforts um, between the Sam Shine Foundation and Origin Park? And um, there aren't reforestation efforts explicitly and um, we are you know supporting origin park um but uh I, I don't know of anything that's on the books right now for needing to be any ownership that needs to be reforested it's more invasive treatment of the things that are in ownership but certainly that would be on the table we, we definitely support reforestation and repairing buffers Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, can the question is, can you, um, are, can you use a muscle to, to talk about pollution and can you look at a muscle individually and say it's from a polluted river? And, um, so they, I'll, I'll first say that they are more resilient than we give them credit for. You know, everybody's sort of gloom and doom about, oh my gosh, we, you know, we can't put anything in the water. Clearly they've been here for hundred, you know, they live a hundred years. They, they can survive. They're really, you know, sensitive in that juvenile stage. And then, um, they just chronically, they can clam up and not, that was my answer to you earlier. They can clam up and not eat for a while. If there's something toxic coming through the system, like they'll, they'll shut down. Um, but they can't, you know, again, you got to eat at some point. So, um, but they will have differences in shell color, um, based on, uh, chemical properties of a stream. So, um, in particular, I'm familiar with, um, some of the smaller streams where, um, you know, there, there's a, an old saying dilution is the solution to pollution. And so smaller streams tend to concentrate bad and, uh, there's manganese, uh, that that's in those stream in some of those, um, central Indiana streams. And it's probably from, 
um, nutrient enrichment from whatever. Um, and so they're really black. Those shells are really black. And those tend in our silos, those tend to be the ones that they don't die, but we call it failure to thrive. They're not growing. And if you don't grow, eventually you do die. So yeah, you can't really look at the Ohio river species and say that's from a polluted river and the Ohio is polluted, but there, there are good muscle beds in the Ohio. And that's something else I should have said. They don't occur ubiquitously in any stream. They occur in specific areas of a stream in what we call beds. Um, and those tend to be the areas of a river where there's not as much water flowing, um, as fat, like what wouldn't be where there's lots of movement of the stream. I would say it'd be on the more stable side. I have not heard of that. Um, the question is, has anybody trying to farm freshwater mussels? Um, I think that would be such a long process. It would take so long to get, I mean, even enriching the water, I don't know that because our water is enriched and they take a long time to grow. So I don't, I, I haven't ever heard of somebody trying that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I do know there are people who will eat those Asian clams because they are fast growing. Um, again, not recommended, but there are people who will do that. I can't imagine it. They're tiny. It would, it would, how, how could, it could be worth it? I don't know, but because it's, it's not a native species, it doesn't, I don't think there's anybody really paying attention to that. Did you have another question? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. So are there citizen science groups doing anything with freshwater mussels that, that it could be in, you could be involved with? Um, and I assume you mean locally. So I don't know of anyone locally that um, is doing any, the, I think the closest thing would be um, the Kentucky Division of Fish and Wildlife Resources does use volunteers to tag um, mussels before they, and they're doing a lot of reintroductions in Kentucky. Um, so they will use volunteers to do that. Um, I have my card and I can give you, I can put you in touch with them. Uh, they also will use volunteers on some, they do some citizen science, um, just kind of days on the uh, Green River. Um, there also is the iNaturalist app where you can um, submit things that you see. And so I definitely suggest anybody do that um, because uh, people find things that, that e even the state biologists don't find because they have access to lands that they don't have access to. So um, I would say becoming, there's also a, um, an app called uh, Muscle, what's it called? Of course, I can't find it on my phone at the moment, but there's a Muscle ID app that's really good. It's called Muscle ID. And um, that would be a place you could go to identify the muscle and then submit to iNaturalist. And usually if you take some good, it's hard to identify muscles by pictures alone, but along with location and, you know, where in the stream and that sort of thing, you can narrow things down. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. All. I've, I've gone over, so I want to be respectful of your time, but I really appreciate you coming in um, again, shells there and a map here. If you want to Look at that. Um, it's got watersheds across Indiana outlined on it. And thank you for being here. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.